In this video, we're going to discuss several different types of market failure. So first off, a market failure is a case when the free market just left to operate on its own is going to produce an allocation of goods and resources that is not Pareto efficient. So if you remember from before, a Pareto efficient allocation is one in which we could not possibly make anyone better off without making at least one person worse off. So that's Pareto efficient. In a market failure, we're in a situation where we could conceivably make a person better off without hurting anyone else. And so if we're in that situation, that means that markets have failed. We haven't produced this Pareto efficient outcome just by letting free markets operate on their own. And so some people would say that implies a role for government intervention. Then the government could come in and implement a policy that could get us to that Pareto efficient outcome. Let's talk about some examples. So first off, an externality is a classic case of a market failure. So there's two types of externalities. There's negative externalities and positive externalities. Let me start with a negative externality because I think it'll be a little easier to understand. So let's take pollution. Let's say that there is a factory that produces some good. Let's say they make steel, for example. And when they make steel, there's, there's these different outputs other than steel, some chemicals or something that's, that's left over after the process is over. And they dump it, and they dump it into a river. And then there's a house upriver where children play in the river. They play in that water, and they don't realize that there's chemicals being dumped into this river here. And the children play, and the, the children get sick and have to go to the hospital. Their parents are paying medical bills and so forth. So what is happening here is that one party, the steel company, is imposing costs on another party, the children, the family, without reimbursing this family. Right Now, if they had worked out some kind of deal where they said, hey, look, we're going to be dumping chemicals in this river, and so therefore we'll give you $20,000 a year for this inconvenience, and the family said, hey, we'll take that. Heartless though it may seem, let's say that that actually happened, then it's not an externality. But what is crucial here is the company or individual or whoever is imposing a cost on another person or party without reimbursing them. Now, positive externality is different in the sense, think of something like a vaccine. So a vaccine is one party is imposing a, or giving a benefit to another party. Now it's not a cost that one person's giving a benefit to another person, but they're not reaping any of that benefit. So if I get a flu, well, let's leave inside the vaccine. We'll say a flu shot. Just set, well, I guess same idea, but we'll say that I get a flu shot, the specific thing, and I get this flu shot, and all the people who work around me or, or people I encounter, they have a less chance of getting the flu because I got a flu shot, right? So I have given them a benefit. I gave myself a benefit, but I also gave them a benefit. Now, they don't go and pay me or say, hey, here's a dollar. Thank you for getting that flu shot, right? So because I don't reap all of the benefits that recruit to other people, then I will be less likely to get a flu shot. If they actually, if I, if I got more than just a benefit to myself and actually got all of the benefits that accrue to society for getting that flu shot, I might be more likely to do it, right? And so when you have a positive externality, that good in question, whether it be a vaccine or whatever, will be undersupplied. And when you have a negative externality, the good in question, let's say steel or whatever it is that's that's being produced that's causing problems, will be oversupplied relative to what would be the socially efficient outcome. Now, so that's externalities. A public good is also another situation when you have a public good that you can have a market failure. And so what is meant by the term public good is it's talking about something very specific, a good that's going to have two qualities. So it's going to be non-rivalrous and non-excludable. And I know that those might be a little obtuse or that are hard to understand. Let me just give you an example and make it a little bit easier. So let's talk about national defense. Let's talk about national defense, the military, and let's take the country of France. Let's take France. I, I'm not going to be able to draw France, but let's just say that that's France. That's a terrible picture, but it's France. So here in France, we, we've got a country with a military and, and so forth. Now let's say somebody from Spain 
moves to France. Let's say one person from Spain decides they want to move to France. Now, by that, when that person moves to France, they are not making it harder for anybody else in France to get national defense, right? They're not interfering with anybody who already lives in France, their, their enjoyment of France's national defense and France's military. Now, let me give you an example of something that would be rivalrous, that would not be, let's say an apple or a fish. If I eat an apple or I eat a fish, then that's one less apple or fish that somebody else could eat, right? So it's rivalrous. Now, when this person moves to France, they're not preventing anyone who lives in France from get, enjoying that benefit of that national defense, right? So that's what it means by non-rivalrous. Non-excludable is that if this person moved to France, it would be very hard to say, okay, we're going to have our military in France defend everybody except this person. If we get attacked, this person's on their own, but everybody else in France, the military is going to protect them. And, and so what that leads to, the, these two properties, is they're going to create an issue. It's called a free rider problem. And the free rider problem is this, that because of these, these two characteristics of the public good, of this national defense in this example, but there are other types, this person who's moving to France, they have no incentive to pay any money for national defense unless you tax them and force them to do it, which is, you know, the government's getting involved. But just voluntarily, this person would not pay for this public good, right? They're not going to pay any money, so they will free ride. And the reason is they don't have to pay. You can't exclude them from getting national defense. If other people are paying for national defense and there's a military and France gets attacked, this person will enjoy the benefits of having the military, whether they paid any money or not. And so because of, because of that way that the public goods are, they will either be undersupplied, so you won't have enough of them, or there, there won't be any supply of the public good at all. And so then people would say, well, the government can come in and play a role by taxing people, taxing this person and everybody else, and forcing them to pay for the public good. Now, you will also have a market failure when you have a monopoly situation. And a monopoly is, is a situation where you have a single firm by itself that is supplying the entire market. Right, so if, if there's just one firm that you can buy goods or services or whatever for, then you have a monopoly. There's, there's, what this really is is a failure of competition. So there's a lack of competition. And the reason that this is a problem is that when you have competition normally, when you have a situation with perfect competition, you'd actually have where firms are what called price takers. So they just have to take the prices given. No single firm can influence the price. And so what will happen is all the firms – They'll just take set the price equal to the marginal cost of the product. But when there's just one firm, when there's a monopolist, then the monopolist can say, okay, well, I have some influence. Or basically, how much I produce, how many of this, this good I produce affects the price. So I can set price in a sense by how much I produce. And so I will set price higher than the marginal cost. Now, the monopolist can't just pick a, a, a just outrageous price that no one will pay because of elasticity of demand. And we'll talk about that in a video when we do on, on monopolies. But just for right now, understand that they, the monopolist can set a higher price than would be achieved were their competition, were their perfect competition. Now, that's good for the monopolist, right? So as the producer, the monopolist is going to have more gains from that. But consumers are going to lose out. And actually, on a net basis... On a net basis, society will be worse off. And so it's because of monopoly, there's a lack of competition, and they can charge a higher price. So that leads to a market failure. But also sometimes you'll have something referred to, you hear incomplete market, or there's some kind of issue with the market. And this could be a number of things. I just want to give you one example of, of where basically a market could, uh, in a certain situation, wouldn't develop, or it, it wouldn't completely develop. And that would be an insurance market. So sometimes there's problems with insurance markets. And the reason that an insurance market would have a hard time developing in certain instances is because of something called uh, a adverse selection and then also another thing called information asymmetry. And I'm going to explain what each of these things. They're very important concepts, and I'll talk to you more specifically about them in an entire video on this topic. 
But with an insurance market, so so let's say that let's say that the people's willingness to pay for insurance, let's say there's a healthy person who says, you know what, I'd be willing to pay a premium of two hundred dollars a month for health insurance. And the insurance company says, Wow, that's wonderful. I actually could give you that insurance for a hundred and fifty a month. So then the insurance company hypothetically could have profit of fifty dollars, so the market would develop, right? Just normally competitive market, there'd be a market here because there's profit to be made, right? So people, their willingness to pay is higher than the cost to actually produce the product of insurance. So you'd think there'd be a market, but there's an issue here, is that when the insurance company says, okay, here, it'll be uh, $150 insurance premium for health insurance. But the people who come to sign up for the insurance, they might not be healthy, right? You might have some healthy people who say, hey, I would have been willing to pay 200 and I can get it for 150 I'll come get the insurance. But you might have sick people, really sick people who want to sign up for the insurance as well. Now, there's nothing wrong with sick people wanting insurance and so forth. But maybe when the, the insurance company was coming up with this price for the premium, they were assuming that the person would be of average health or something like that. And if you have mostly sick people who sign up because they are the people who need insurance the most, right? If you're sick, which is an issue called adverse selection, then you could have an issue where they say, oh, well, the insurance company says, hey, we'd be losing money if we charge this premium. We better jack up the premium. So then they say, okay, well, we'll put the premium at 225. But then maybe some of the healthy people say, hey, I was willing to pay 200, cause, but I'm healthy. I don't want to pay 225. So they leave, and now you're left with even higher proportion of sick people. So the ultimate problem is what's called information asymmetry, is that you know more about your health than the insurance company does. And so that's a problem for the insurance company in terms of trying to figure out how to set the price and how to determine what your price is and so forth. And there are ways, that basically insurance companies could offer deductibles and stuff like that. I won't get into all that to kind of address this, but it makes it difficult for the market to develop, even though that some people's willingness to pay is higher than the cost of the product. Also, sometimes you'll have not an incomplete market, but incomplete information in the market where the market on its own does not supply enough information to consumers. And that could be an issue with, with lending, maybe payday loans. People don't understand really what the interest rate is that they're paying. Or if you think about with pharmaceuticals, with, with, uh, with drugs. So if you go to get some pharmaceutical drugs and, and, or some, some prescription, if you don't know what's in that drug, you, you might have some kind of an issue. And so people say, hey, well, the government should come in and people don't really understand what's in drugs. It's very complicated. So they should come in and force these companies to come up with a label, right? So they should make them have a label that explains what's in the drug, explains what the side effects are. The market on its own is not going to supply that information and consumers aren't savvy enough to really understand. They don't know a lot about pharmaceutical drugs and so forth. Also, sometimes people will say that there's a market failure when you have just really, really high unemployment or, or inflation of some countries in the 20th century, uh, Germany, Zimbabwe, just had really, really high inflation, just so high that it was ridiculous. Or, or countries right now have unemployment is higher or higher than 25%. The United States during the Great Depression had unemployment around 25%. People were living in hobo camps and so forth. And so people would say, hey, look, if there's some kind of serious macroeconomic problem where there's that many people that want to find work and they can't, that might be indicative of a market failure itself.